This is class number 10 or 11 or something like that about tefillah. And that's pretty neat because we haven't, we've really touched the edges of it so far. Let's take a look at today's goal, today's notes. Here we go. If you were to, um, we're going to look at the structure of the Amidah in specific today. Okay. If you had an appointment with an important person, the Supreme Court, President, whoever it might be, and you have to discuss something important, a pressing matter that would affect your business, your kahila, your community, your family, obviously you do your homework and you prepare an agenda before the actual meeting. Uh, following some polite introductory words, you would probably talk about the most important issues on the at the beginning of the meeting. And at the conclusion, you would, of course, uh, express your gratitude for finding, you know, for, you know, thank you for finding the time to meet with me. So when you're meeting with Hashem, which is what the Amidah is, obviously you're going to, going to want to meet, to meet with him in a similarly attentive manner. I do want to say congratulations to the Kihila for having a minion for uh, Mincha and Mariv on Friday night, and Shachris Mincha, Shachris Musaf and Mincha and Mariv on Shabbos, and um, and uh, we we got a minion. We davened actually Mincha Mariv outside in the rain because the tenth man refused to come inside. I'll mention any names, uh, but we were protected by the awning, ninety five percent, and the wind wasn't blowing. So if the wind is not blowing, then the water doesn't come at you sideways. So we actually, we actually got to Davin. We didn't, we did, we did not bring a Torah out to, in the rain. So we didn't have Kriyas Torah yesterday afternoon, but congratulations to the Kehillah that we got through a rainy Shabbos. Uh, well, later on, we'll talk about how noisy that machine is inside and if there's anything to do about it. Because I did not bother speaking over that machine. It's way too loud. Uh, but it's possible that there are other settings that we can use. But we can talk we about can, it later. Um, we don't, we don't, not, not right now, Marina, not, let's talk about it. Later. Okay, if we get a donation, I'll take care of it. Okay. All right, so um, praise, request, and gratitude. The 19 blessings of the Amidah are divided into three sections. Praise, requests, and thanks. The Talmud says, and I know that many of us are curious about, like, why do we praise Hashem that we need our praise? The Talmud says that in the first three blessings, um, we are to liken ourselves to a servant praising his master, the master upon whom you depend for everything. I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody. There's just a little bit of feedback coming through. So the Talmud says in the first three blessings, we should, we should liken ourselves to a servant praising our master, our master upon whom we are dependent for everything, before we dare request anything from him, which are the middle blessings. And the last three blessings, each of us should act like a servant, thanking our master for what we've received, and then take our leave from him. Do we have the mishpacha here? There's an incredible article, this past week's mishpacha. I'm going to see if I can find it online. They started, they started posting uh, quite, a, quite a few of their articles online, actually, which is very, very nice. Um, mishpacha magazine did. And... Um, and there was an article by Rabbi Ginsburg. Who is Rabbi Ginsburg? Rabbi Ginsburg is a rav of a shul in Queens, I think. And he, um, he was hit by corona. His family was uh, told, like I found it. Yeah. His family was told to come a few times to say goodbye to him. And he miraculously survived uh, his stint in the ICU. Okay. And I'm going to share a link with you. Please, I encourage you all to read it later, okay? You can look at it in the chat here. And um, really beautiful, incredible article. If you've seen it already, probably some of you on here have already seen it. I encourage you to look at it, like I said, later, not right now. But I know one of the questions that bothers us is like, why does Hashem really need our praises? And I think that, although he doesn't come to address this particular question in particular, I think it offers a perspective. On, on praising Hashem. 
the difference, by the way, between praising Hashem and thanking Hashem is not really so, it's so great. Just, let me say that one more time. I, I, I'm making this up, but I believe it to be true. The difference between praising God and thanking God is not really that significantly different. Obviously, it's a little bit different. Something called the Berchas Hoda'a, which is a brach of thanksgiving. Berchas HaShevach, which is a brach of praise. Obviously, they are different. But in a sense, they can be perhaps grouped uh, together. Well, let's take a look. Uh, let's take a look at, at the Talmud, where the Talmud shares uh, the perspective and the, and the framework of the Amidah and where it comes from. Um, I'm going to just share my screen with you here. Okay, let's take a look here. So the first Gemara is in Brachos, page 32a. And we'll take a look at the second Brachos, sure. When Moshe Davin, he prefaced his prayer with praises of Hashem. Darash Rabbi Simloi. Rabbi Simloi expounded. Le'olam, he said, A person should first organize, order the praise of Hashem, and afterwards he should pray. Now, the Gemara's question is not why, but the Gemara's question is minolan. In English, from where do we know this? Meaning, the Gemara doesn't even ask why. Is that interesting? Rather, Gemara says, okay, you're telling me that it's important that before I ask Hashem for anything, that I should praise him, that's all well and good. But at those who learn Gemara know the Gemara very rarely asks, I shouldn't say very rarely, the Gemara sometimes asks my taima, which is what's the reason? But in this case, the Gemara doesn't ask that question. But rather, Gemara assumes that there has to be some sort of a precedent. And therefore, the Gemara's question is minalan, from where do we know this? Meaning, meaning that it has got to be some sort of a protocol. The protocol has precedent in the Torah itself. Once that's true, then that sets the model for us. Why is a separate question. Okay, let's take a look. Minalan, from where do we know this? Mimosha. We know it from Moshe Rabbeinu. The Ksiv, the Torah says in Devarim, chapter 3, verse 23, And I prayed to Hashem at that time. Viksiv. And then in the next pasuk it says, Shem Elokim. God is speaking to Mo- Moshe. Is speaking to God. He says, God, you have begun to show your servant your greatness, your mighty hand. What God is there in heaven and earth who can do according to your works and according to your mighty acts? And then. The next pasuk says, the next pasuk reads, Ebrana, please Hashem, allow me to cross over the Jordan. The era is Aratatova, allow me to see this good land. So what's the structure? The structure is first Hashem, first Moshe praises God, and then he makes the ask. That's the structure. Is that is that really praise or is it recognition? They're different. That's why I kind of said when it comes to thanks and pray, and praise, maybe you can lump them together. So let me say the same thing to you. Recognizing who you're davening to and praising him in the context of the Gemara really is the same thing. Because what you're doing in a sense is you're establishing the address. You're writing the, uh, you know, you, if you write a letter and you mail it, in an envelope and the outside of the envelope is blank, well, if you have a return address, you'll get it back. But if you don't have a return address on there, you'll never see it. It seems that Tfila works in some ways in the same way. And that is that first you have to establish the address of to whom it is that you are praying. That's what Moshe Abinu does here. He says, I'm gonna dab in Tashem. Which Hashem? Hashem. I know you. You're the one who's begun to show your servants, meaning me, your greatness, your strong hand, 
it makes sense to daven to you. There's no other God to daven to. Nobody else, no, no other power can act as you do. And then immediately you have this prayer itself. Ebra, no, let me cross over. Which of course is the, con- the subject of his prayer in Parshas Vatkana. I'm just pointing out, to me, an obvious um, observation. Give me one second, please. The point on obvious observation, which is the Gemara doesn't ask why. The Gemara says, mean no one, from where do we know this? Meaning, what's the precedent? Is there a protocol? And of course, here you have it. The Gemara, it's a couple pages later, the, the, tells us, goes into more detail about the first three blessings. And this is, again, um, you know, a perspective of the Amoroyim. And it's not necessarily the only perspective, but obviously it's one that does fit, certainly is, is accurate about our own tefillahs. Omer Rav Yehuda. Rav Yehuda said, Le'olam. The word Le'olam means always. Le'olam literally means forever, but in the context of the Gemara, it really means always. Al Yishal Adam Tzrachav, Lo Bishal Shishonov, Lo Bishal Shachronov, Ela Be'emtayot. The person should not ask for anything, not in the first three blessings and not in the last three blessings, only in the middle. And the, he offers proof or support from Rabbi Hanina. Rabbi Hanina, Rishonos, Doma, Le'evich, and Mitzad, Shevach, and Rabbo. The first three brachos are organized in such a way that you, it's like, it's like, it's akin to an Eved, to a servant who is organizing praise in front of his master. And Tzoyos, which are the middle brachos, it's like a servant who requests uh, um, a reward or some sort of a prize. The word pras in Hebrew really means prize in English. It's almost the same word phonetically. Okay. From his master. The final, the final three brachos, it's like somebody who it's taking leave of his master and is thanking him for his, for, you know, for sharing. Okay, so the concept, the Amidah, obviously these, these Amaroyim, they wrote this when? After, after the Amidah was already organized, they're commenting on the structure of the Amidah. But as I mentioned, when a person davens, you can always daven to Hashem outside of the Amidah, and certainly they did that before uh, the destruction of the first base on Migdash, that's how they used to daven. And they had the same structure. Because again, part of Torah Shabbal Peh, part of the oral Torah was that when a person does make, a, make an ask from Hashem, it should be prefaced with praise. And then the end of the sandwich should be uh, a thank, thanksgiving and appreciation. A couple more uh, sources here. Okay. Second. Just one question. Is the same Amidah for the Yom Tovim and High Holidays? Yes. In other words, because the the High Holidays, Amidah, and the Yom Tovim, every as I mentioned in the past, every Amidah begins with the opening three and the closing three. The only difference between the high holidays and, and the, a regular Yantif is the third bracha is much, much longer, right? The third bracha, Atta Kadosh, Shimcha Kadosh, Shukdoshim, Cholim, Eluchasela. Normally we end it right there, Baruch Hashem Akela Kadosh. But Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, what do we do? We say, Bisim Locha Tashem Lebadecha, Komatecha. We talk about Hashem's Malchus, we talk about Hashem being the king. And it's about another additional five paragraphs or so. And then you say, But the structure is the same. You have the opening three and the closing three. Okay, let's take a look at the Rambam. The Rambam writes in Hechus Tefillah uh, that these, these three sections are all encompassing. So he says like this, of mitzvazu. This is the structure of the duty or the obligation of this commandment. Kahu, this is how it is. Shehe Adam Mitchanain. 
Yom. A person should beg and pray every single day. Okay, that's number one. That's the that's the overarching, I guess, idea that a person should have to pray every day. Number one, Magid Shavachu Shalakadosh Baruch Hu. He should first give offer a praise. Achakach Shalat Rachav. Then he should make the ask, as they say nowadays. Shavu Tzarech Lahem. Things that he needs. Bivakasha Uvitchina. With a request and with supplication. Bivakasha with a request and supplication. You may recall at the end of either last period, I think two classes ago, I shared the Mishnah in Rachel. The Mishnah in Rachel says, so anybody who makes his tefillah, so anyone who makes his tefillah into a uh, like a heavy load, so the language of the Mishnah is, ain't tefillah so tachanunim. His prayer is not a supplication. And what that means is, if a person davens in such a way that they're just trying to get over and done with the davening, then they haven't really davened. Because davening is, is begging, is pleading. That's what davening is. Pardon me again. Uh, I, I, uh, I wonder if anybody here has experienced, and if you have, how often, a tefillah, a prayer, not a prayer that you simply say the word, but a prayer that is like the call of the shofar. You know what I mean by that? A prayer that comes from your depths, that it's a, it's a sob. It's a cry for help. And it's not please cure somebody in simply like in simple words like that. But it's a prayer that is comes from such a deep place. You didn't even know that such a place existed. Usually that kind of prayer comes from a need or for someone that you love. But again, I'm not talking about something that's done by road or even words. I'm not, uh, again, uh, there's nothing wrong. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with saying the words by rote. I daven for Tehillah all the time, but I daven by, by rote for her, essentially. Because it's an ongoing kind of a thing. Am I making sense? But imagine, imagine the one-time prayer. When, imagine if you were driving, you'd have to pull over. You wouldn't be able to like drive. You wouldn't, cause you, cause you, can't, you can't contain yourself. You can't control yourself. You're literally sobbing from the deepest part of yourself. Can you imagine davening like that? I, 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 don't, I can't tell you how many times in my life that I've davened like that. One, twice, three times. That's with a sister who was sick and a best friend who was sick and a father who was sick. And yet, and then various needs that come up. It's very easy to daven for a need. Just say the words. It's a whole nother thing to daven in the way that I'm describing. Am I making sense? Do you know, do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, so I'm just I'm just wondering, you know, now it's not, we're not going to have group therapy tonight to discuss, you know, those times in which we made such prayers. But I, but I wonder, I wonder because I know that for myself and for my wife, when we have daven like that, we've seen results in a different way than at other times. And it goes back, one second, one second, one second. It goes back a little bit to the article that I read in reference to, which is that the result isn't always the exact result that you're hoping for, but it's a step in the right direction. I'm just curious, you know, you can tell me some other time privately about this, but I, to me, that's tachanunim, that's supplication, that's begging. Okay, Jerry, go ahead. Uh, Rabbi, the, 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 the brachot that are in between the three first brachot and the last three brachot, are they, are they the, the asks? Uh, are the brachot the themselves the asks? And is the Amidah meant as a request, as an ask? Or is it optional? Can, or is it, can, can the whole Amidah be praise and thanks? Because it seems <laughs> after, at the end of each bracha, there is 
ברוך אתה אז השם, ואוהב המשפט. Because um, earlier, when you started talking about, we, you talked about the structure of the tefillah, and I, I don't remember that you, uh, that te, uh, uh, of a tefillah. I, I, I don't have the structure in front of me. I can probably get it uh, from what you said. And there were seven parts, but tefillah was not part of that, you know. And I, so I, and, and I remember asking you at that time, why, why was that? I mean, what, what, what? what It, well, you had you had asked me no, no you you had asked me about tachanun. I'm not referring to tachanun right now. I'm referring to I'm not referring to the. You had asked me, Barry. I remember your question in your email, and I actually did not answer that particular question, although I answered other questions in your email. Um, you asked me where tachanun fits in in the four parts of davening. Okay, that was a fair question. I didn't get to it. Okay, now tachanun is different than tachanunim. Is it really different? No, it's the same word. But when the Rambam, and let me share, share the Rambam with you again, when the Rambam makes reference to the middle brachos, where he says, that that when the middle part of the Amidah, which is when you're asking for, you're asking for things, but you're doing so with a request and with supplication, with begging. So that's what I'm referring to over here. That's not okay. Tachanun. That's something totally different than Tachanun. Okay? So going back to the Rambam, I'm just pointing out that that language is very similar to the language of the Mishnah. The Mishnah, which I'll find for you in a moment here. The Mishnah says that anybody who makes his tefillah Anybody who makes a tefillah, let me just find the exact language for you. Take a look at this here. Um, here we go. Rabbi Eliezer Omer. Rabbi Eliezer taught. Mishnah Dalit. Ha'oset tefilaso keva. Ein tefilaso tachanunim. Anybody who makes his tefillah keva. So what does keva mean? Permanent. 
permanent. Permanent. So if you take a look at the at, at the commentary here, okay. So he says, what does it mean? Also, tefila so keva. So he says here. That your prayer is like it's like a burden. You ever go to show where you just have to like get it done with? Okay. Can anybody relate to that? I don't know about you, but I can relate to that. It's a it's a rule. This is one of my rules I have to do. I just have to fulfill it as you know as easily or as quickly as I can. Okay. So the Mishnah says. That if somebody davens with that kind of perspective, so let's look at this language here, very important language. Ain't filoso tachanunim. Let me show it to you, I'm sorry. Ain't filoso tachanunim. His tfila is not supplication, is not tachanunim. It's not referring to tachanun, but the same language the Ramam is using here. His tefillah is not, it, it, it's not a tefillah. In order for a tefillah to be a tefillah, it has to be the vakasha uvetchina. That's the language of the Rambam. Okay? So I'm, that's why I'm getting caught up on this. This language here, tchina. It's got to come from a deep place. In English, the petition, a bad translation. I shouldn't say a bad, a weak translation. Okay, so again, the Rambam says, in order to fulfill the mitzvah of tefillah every day, you, there's a certain structure to it. Number one, you begin with shavach praise. Number two, you make the ask. Number three, no sin shavach mehodayo. You go for more praise and thanksgiving to Hashem. Ala tova sheish bialo. For the goodness that Hashem has done. Kol achad kifi kocha. We actually saw this Rambam earlier. Each one according to his own ability. Now, kevan shara. Zach, you may have missed this last time around, so we're... This is a little bit of a review, and um, uh, um, it, 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 it talks about what we're talking about tonight, but we've talked about this in terms of the context of when the tefillah was instituted, that you asked me about last week. The came in Shira, Ezra, when Ezra and his court saw the situation as it was, meaning that people were not really able to daven, and I pointed out, because davening doesn't mean saying words, davening is a very, is a meditative experience, and obviously different people can can uh, accomplish different levels of, of meditation, of connection to Hashem. It's interesting, those of you, some of you probably meditate on a regular basis. It's called a practice. Why is it called a practice? Because you're not either good at it or bad at it, but something that you're always working and developing. I think tefillah should also really be considered, lahavdil, a practice as well. It says, Rama, Kibben Shara, Ezra, Besino, Kach, Omdu, Vitikinu, Lehem, Shemona, Esrei, Rachat, Allah, Seder. When Ezra and his days didn't saw the situation that people were not able to daven properly, so they codified, they formalized the Shmona Esrei. Shalash Rishonos, Shevach Lashem, the first three praise Hashem. Shalash Achronos, Hodaya, the final three is Thanksgiving. And Sayos, Yish Behen She'ilas Kol Hadvarin. There are there requests for every kind of thing. Shein Kimo Avos, the Cholchavte Ish Ve'ish. The requests are just kind of general requests. That, uh, that are, in English here is not bad, encompassing all the categories of each individual needs and communal needs. In other words, it's just, it's written in a general way, and obviously a person can be more specific about what they need. A person is davening to pass a test, so they can daven that Hashem should give them the, the memory they need. Well, talk about memory, but not specifically for the test. You can apply it however, however it applies for you in your life. But the, I don't understand. Rabbi, uh, I'm yeah. having a problem. I, we're talking about the Amida and yeah. the request and the depth that you're speaking of. Is that the depth of your kavanah or is that the depth of your personal talking or discussion with Hashem? Why do you see that as two separate things? Well, that's what maybe it's the same thing. Asking. Yeah, but I mean, are you thinking about what you really want and asking for while you are davening, or is it separate? 
again, it, it, depending on the because what you're asking is what bracha, brachot. Well, the, on the particular bracha that you're up to. So if you're davening for, for parnasa and you're in Barich Aleinu, it's very appropriate to speak to Hashem about parnasa and your own personal needs in that bracha. But not in the context of Amidah, just generally. Or no, in, in, the, in the, yeah, in, during the Amidah. When you're saying Barich Aleinu, you, yeah, when you're saying Barich Aleinu, you're davening parnasa. Look, in Shemak Aleinu, you could daven for whatever you like. It doesn't make sense to daven for refuah in the middle of uh, the Lama Shinim. Yeah. Different subject, right? Yeah. But, yeah. and yeah, and, and uh, I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes if I'm thinking about something, the beginning of the Shimon Esrei, I find myself stepping back at the end of the Shimon Esrei and I'm still thinking about that same thing. Okay, that wasn't a very good Shimon Esrei, was it? Okay, I think that probably some of us can relate to that. Okay, but the idea obviously is that within each, the context of each bracha, you refocus yourself on what it is that you're referring to and talking about. But certainly in terms of if you're a personal need and you're davening for it in the context of a particular bracha, absolutely. Okay. Can you add words to the Amidah? You, you, the answer is yes. Now there's different ways of doing it. Some say it's better to wait to a Lokai Nitzur, which is at the end of the Amidah. Some say it's better to wait till Shema Koleinu. And others say no, you can always daven the aim. We can always dive in for, look, if you look in your sitter, uh, you asked me to bring an article sitter. I don't have one in front of me. I'm sorry. Okay. If you look in your sitter in Rifa'enu, which is bracha number four, I think, okay, of the, of the middle of bracha. I think so. So if, there it says, Yiraton, Yiraton, Shetishlach Mehera, Rifua Shalema, Mina Shemaim, Rifua Shalema, Rifua Shalema, Rifua Shalema, Rifua Shalema, Rifua Shalema, Rifua blank, the Sof Shachal Yisrael. So there's a Yiratzon to daven for a Rufu Shleimah for somebody. Does that make sense? Does that sound familiar? It's in, it's in your Siddur, in Rufa'inu. In the Svardi Siddur, it's very interesting. It's a different Yiratzon. There the Yiratzon says that Hashem should send a Rufu Shleimah to me so that I can serve Hashem. Okay? And that's when I think about my, you know, my right hamstring and my left Achilles and all my baseball injuries, you know? So a uh, person should, shouldn't be bothered by nagging injuries so they can serve Hashem in the best way possible. And the Sephardi Seder has many, many additions to, uh, to, to, their, to, the, to the Amidah that are much more personal. But yeah, you can even use English and whatever, say whatever you want to, and as long as it pertains to the topic at hand. You may, yes. Okay, 100%. I'm, I'm a, I hope everyone knows that for, for the last 30 years. It's important, very important. Uh, uh, you know, the famous story, I've shared the story before with the, with the Chavetz Chaim, that there was a young man who went to the Chavetz Chaim and said, listen, I, I, I try to have a lot of Kavano when I dive in and I, and I spend a lot of time thinking about each word and I, and I imagine that the words going up to Hashem and all this kind of stuff. And no matter what, no matter how much Kavano I have, your Amidah is longer than mine. So you ask the Chavetz Chaim, how can you dive in such a long Amidah? Like, what are you, what's your secret? And he said, no, I'm sure you have more kavana than I have, he told the young man. The difference between you and me is when I get to mode them, I stop and I think about everything that I'm grateful for. So did he actually say the words or did he just think them? I don't know. But certainly the Amidah is meant to, is a platform for, as the Ramam says, it, they're all general. But you are, you're meant to have a personal tefillah. And obviously you can do so in the context of the Amidah. Okay. Let's take a look at Rabbi Monk's comment about the first three brachos and the last three brachos and the relationship between the two of them. It's a very interesting comment. Rabbi Dr. Eli Monk, the world of prayer. These, first, these three first blessings describe God as the source of all that exists, the master of nature. They provide an answer to the three ultimate questions who governs the universe, what are his powers, what influences him, and the answers are, you're the God of our forefathers, you're the merciful provider and protector, you're not influenced by earthly consideration. The first bracha is called Avot. In the second, we declare God to be omnipotent, givurot, strength. Finally, in the Kedusha, he's praised as the Holy One who guides the world in holiness detached from all earthly influences, and it was therefore feared by all. The last three blessings of the Amidah 
treat the relationship of the receiver to the giver. They run parallel to the first three. The answer to the question is, who are we? What are our powers and what influences us? The answers are, we're God's servants. That's the avoda. That's your say Hashem Elokeinu. We ask Hashem to accept our service. We are powerless, dependent upon Him, and therefore filled with gratitude, hoda, and thanksgiving. God is powerful. We are powerless. In everything, we are subject to divine rule. Only the heavenly harmony of peace within and without maintains our existence amidst the conflict of discordant forces. So that is shalom. That is, without Hashem, we don't have shalom. We don't have peace. This is a fascinating and interesting uh, little blurb here that's worthy of some consideration and thought. It answers a question which I always had, which is why do we refer to the final three brachos? What did the Ramam call it? What did the Gemara call it? Let's take a look here. Chronos, Dome Le'evet Shemikabel Prof Me Rabo V'Niftar V'Holek Lo. It's like the servant who got what he asked for and, he, and now he's leaving. Okay? So that's Thanksgiving. The last three brachos are referred to as Thanksgiving. How are the last three brachos referred to as Thanksgiving? Only the 18th bracha, Modim, is Thanksgiving. Ritzay is not Thanksgiving. And Sim Shalom is not Thanksgiving. If you look at the last three brachos of the Amidah, only one of them is, is actually thanking Hashem. This comment from Rabbi Monk is a very good starting point to answer that question. It's not about Thanksgiving. It's about answering the questions of who are we versus who is Hashem. And that also helps a little bit understand, you know, what does it mean that we're praising Hashem? What does it mean that we're praising Hashem? It's, again, it, it answers the questions of who governs the universe, what are its powers, and what influences it. Uh, I'm happy to share this with anybody who wants it. It's a very interesting point. Let's do one more piece over here. And... Um, Now we'll go. We'll go from there. The bulk of the Amidah consists of requests to God for various needs. Our various needs as individuals, as a community, as a nation. Expressing our needs to God, we've talked about this a little bit before is a valuable means of developing a personal relationship with him. Of Shimshim Pinkus says as follows. Tachlis hatfila eina habakashos kishala atman. The goal of prayer is not the request that we ask from Hashem, but rather it's the connection to and the relationship with God. So what's the, what's the, what's the other request? He says that man's requests, needs, and wants are the strongest means or the focus to connect with Hashem. And of course, the, the framework is we ask, we receive, and we give thanks. So what I think is saying here is that The reason why we make these requests, and a lot of the requests are, are not personal, and a lot of the requests are seem kind of similar to each other. And certainly, as we talked about, every Shimon Esrei is pretty seems very similar to the previous Shimon Esrei. So we answer that in different ways. What I think it's saying over here is that it establishes the connection and the relationship with Hashem. See, I probably shared this metaphor with you in the past about this guy who, um, he's 52 years old. He has a son who's 16. His first wife is divorced and estranged or dead. Um, he meets up with this young trophy wife who's 23 years old. She marries him. He's an extremely wealthy guy. She says to her husband, I I'm willing to marry you, but one condition, I'm not in, I don't want your 16-year-old involved in our life. 
and the man says to his 16 year old son, here's keys to a Lamborghini. Here are the keys to a condo in South Miami Beach. Here's my unlimited credit card. Go enjoy your life. One condition, don't call me. This is a metaphor for the snake. Everyone asks the question, why does this, in what way is a snake being punished by slithering on the ground and eating dust? They'll never go hungry in the context of the Chumash, where it says it's going to eat dust. Isn't food is plentiful? And the answer is, Hashem is telling the snake, I don't want anything to do with you. Don't come to me. Take care of yourself. The difference between Egypt and Israel. Egypt has the Nile. It doesn't need God. It just needs the Nile to have water in it, right? But the Nile is going to irrigate the whole country. Israel doesn't have the Nile. Israel needs rain. Without the rain, you don't have, you don't have food. So God establishes the people in the land of Israel in the context of, of the relationship where they need him. And they have to behave <laughs> as we see throughout Tanakh. Yeah? Tefillah is meant to establish the need, and the need establishes the relationship. I think that's what Rav, Rav Pink is to say. If you give me everything I want and everything I need, and you say, don't talk to me, then there's no relationship. That's the purpose of that analogy. There's an obvious question here. It's one of the questions that you probably asked originally in your multiple, in, in your many emails to me, which is that, It seems strange to ask God for things he knows we want. It seems strange to ask God for things he already knows that we want. Furthermore, if he hasn't, if he hasn't given us what we want yet, but he has a good reason for that. So what are we trying to do? Change his mind? This is one of the basic questions about the, the ask. Anybody bought a, a lottery ticket for the billion dollar lottery? I know there's a guy in the show that buys lottery tickets with the, with the goal of paying the show's mortgage. Did you know that? Lots of us. Lots of us, okay. Now, um, it's very fun to uh, fantasize what you would do with the money. I'll tell you this, my father, Lava Shalom, used to say that with the money comes the Yitzhahara to not give it away. Does that sound right to anybody? With the money comes the Yitzhahara to hold on to it. Because if I ask you now, what would you do with a billion dollars? You'd talk about all the foundations you would set up and how you would spend the money and or whatever. But the moment you get the money, you're not doing anything. I shouldn't say not doing anything, but it, it, it's very hard to keep that, the, you know, those, those fantasies alive. Okay. So Rabbi Abraham Tversky, in his book called Tversky on Prayer, he talks about this idea of prayer changing us and not God. He's right, he writes as follows. One of the problems many theologians have grappled with is why and how does prayer work? If a sick person prays for recovery, he's assuming that God has allowed him to become sick. If he's to believe that his prayer can make God change his mind. By the way, I saw someone posted today that Rabbi Tversky himself has COVID, and I think he's in his 90s. In general, I think he's not particularly well these days, my impression. If he's to believe that his prayer can make God change his mind, one of the answers given is that there's a constant outpouring of divine benevolence to the world. Just as the sun radiates light, yet there are areas of darkness and enclosures where the sunlight does not reach. So does the benevolence not reach where there are barriers that obstruct it. These barriers are a person's actions that are contrary to the will of God. Genuine, sincere prayer brings a person into a closer relationship with God. I just want to mention, tshuva, ashivenu avinu l'toratecha, v'karvenu makinu l'avodatecha, v'achvireinu b'tshuva shlema l'fanecha. I think it's the second of the middle of the brachos, isn't it? We ask Hashem to accept our tshuva. That's personal, as well as obviously communal. Genuine, sincere prayer brings a person to a close relationship with God. The barriers to the divine benevolence are thereby removed or circumvented, and the person can then receive this benevolence. 
the blessing and improvement in the person's health is not the result of a change in God's will, but of a change in the status of the recipient. Genuine prayer brings about a transformation in a person. The newly emerging person can be receptive of the divine benevolence to which the former person was impervious. In other words, we open the gates of blessing by changing ourselves. I mean, that's, what, that's how Bitorsky is approaching this. There's a couple more pieces here that are, that are relevant, um, but I think we'll talk about them next time in terms of what we're davening for um, with regard to other people and then davening for one's spiritual needs. I think let's hold off on, on that for next week, Emir Tashem, and then we'll, we'll, we'll take it from there. I, I thank everybody for coming tonight.